So it was a ZFS box. I decided, you know, with all the recent NSA wiretapping, you know, if I want to send back a drive for RMA or do any, you know, or stuff like that, I would prefer to have my data encrypted on the hard drive. And so I decided that I was going to do Jelly encryption on my hard drive. So I bought, I had acquired a server, six core server, and deployed Jelly encryption, and the performance was very, very slow. I think I was only getting like 150 megabytes per second, and this was on eight spindles with the six cores. All six cores were completely saturated, you know, and it was a modern like 2.8 gigahertz CPU, and it's like, I should be getting better performance than this. That's completely unacceptable performance. And so I, and when I first deployed this, I was using software encryption. And after doing some research, because I had bought, purchased an AMD Optron, I knew about the AS9 instructions that Intel had done, but I hadn't realized that AMD had deployed it in some of their processors. So after a little bit of investigation, I was like, what if my processor does have it? It turned out it did. I enabled AS9, and I saw almost no improvement in performance. And I'm like, the company that I had previously worked for, Cryptography Research, they actually did a review of the ASNI instructions, so I knew that the performance that I should get from using these instructions should be significantly faster than using software crypto. And I'm like, why is that happening? And you know, I, I knew that the performance should be greater than a gigabyte per second for the stuff. I mean, sure, disk system has overhead, and there's a lot of other things that can impact performance, but 150 megabytes per second was just unex um, unacceptable. And obviously, if it's slow, people won't use it. You know, if you know if the you know they need to do a gigabyte per second to their storage array, and they can only get 100 megabytes per second, then they're going to have to turn off encryption. It's just not acceptable to be slow. And through a little bit of work, also to try to make it more maintainable. So one of the main um, encryption algorithms used in um, Jelly is AES. So I'll go over what is AES. AES is a basic block cipher mode. It takes in 16 bytes of input. It permutes the data in, in well, it does not permute the bits, but it actually generates another um, 16 bytes that mapped are, is a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, AES is what is called a PRF, a, sorry, a PRP, a pseudo-random permutation. And that means that there will always be a one-to-one -one mapping from the input to the output. And when you're doing ciphers, this is very important because if it was like a PRF, which is what most hash functions is, you would not be able to reverse it. And so um, that. So the basic structure is they do an add round key, which is a simple XOR of the first 16 bytes of the um, key schedule, and then each additional round after that is a combination of sub-bytes, which is a simple, um, each byte is basically looked up in a table of 256. It can get a little bit more, but I'm sure not too many people are interested. Shift rows, shift things around, mix columns, mix the columns around, and then again you add the round key. And depending upon how many your key size will determine uh, round keys and other stuff. And then the final round is slightly different in that mixed columns does not happen. So there's different things that can affect the performance of AES. One of them, um, there's different cipher modes um, because the standard mode that you've always seen, actually, now I think about it, I should have thrown in the, how, how many people have seen the Penguin ECB uh, picture? <laughs> So if, if, if you've seen it, um, it's basically they take a, a PNG of the Linux Penguin and they encrypted it with, in ECB mode and you view it and yes, all the colors are wrong, but you can actually still make out that it's a Penguin. And that's because the common colors were in the picture, like the solid background, got all encrypted to the same value. And so you can still see that. And so ECB is not, um, is, I was just reading on Twitter the other day that people were like, you know, why do people include ECB modes in crypto libraries? Well, it's also useful for building other cipher modes. And so there's a couple of different other, um, the, and 
since we're actually talking about disencryption, the other thing that becomes important is sector size. Because every time you do uh, pass through various stacks and layers, as you know, encryption, um, there's a certain fixed cost overhead. And by increasing sector size, you actually amortize the cost over and you can um, do better pipelining. And then ob obviously key size, larger key size, more rounds, and then it comes out being slower. So one of the things is, as I talked about, it was slow. The thing is, is like, I, you know, if you benchmark open SSL, this is the performance numbers that you were getting on various different modes. And I'll talk about the modes in a little bit. So the blue line is CBC encrypt. Part of the reason why, and this is actually, the, this baseline performance is, is enabling AES&I. By default, if you don't, if you just do OpenSSL speed, AES128, CBC, it will use some um, built-in C assembly, but not ASNI version. So you need to do dash EVP to actually get real ASNI performance. And so this demonstrates that with different cipher modes, you can get dramatically different performance. And this also relates to the different sector, um, sector sizes. If you use a really small sector size, the overhead becomes, um, becomes too great and you don't actually get as much performance. So Jelly has both ASCBC and XTS modes implemented in it. As you can see, the XTS mode is much more ideal than using the CBC mode when using ASNI. So the next question, is, as I was talking, is different cipher modes. The reason why there is um, the big performance degradation in CBC mode is the fact that you cannot end up pipelining CBC while, while you can with XTS. And the reason why you cannot pipeline CBC is, is that after each block encryption, you need to output ciphertext to actually XOR onto the next plaintext in order to derive the next block encryption layer. As you can see with XTS, and this will be appearing, for those who are in the know, this will be appearing on Wikipedia. I created it just for today. <laughs> um, the XTS um, lock cipher mode is actually tweakable. So what is commonly used in this case, I is inputted as the like sector number into another like, lock cipher algorithm. And then since, and then this is a simple Galois LFSR increment for each round, and then that is used that. Um, as to XOR plain text, encrypt, and then XOR the tweak factor again on t um, to generate the ciphertext. As you can see, each of these block cipher out, um, encryption or decryption blocks, depending upon which way you're going, is now independent. And this Galois LFSR is relative, it can be made very cheap. And because of this, we can now actually pipeline the AS encryption and decryption modes and achieve some of the very good thing. Uh, then there's the other, as I mentioned and showed some numbers, the counter mode is similar to, oh, sorry, yes, question. Quick question. Yes. Why aren't you losing a lot of the uh, encryption by going between the CDC to XDX? Because the LFSR is pretty predictable. So, um, that, well, it's a combination of the LFSR it could theoretically be predicted, but the thing is, is that A, the block cipher, you, the attacker won't know key two, so they'll, they'll not know that. The other thing is, is that even if they were, you know, even if they have the plain text and the cipher text, they do not necessarily, they don't know what, they also don't know what this block encryption layer will be. And, and so they cannot really determine what the tweak factor is. So even if they were able to, I don't, you know, have both the plain text and the cipher text, you know, be able to write their own file, it would be, I'm, I'm not a cryptographer, so I can't say exactly. It would be very difficult to get the tweak factor and do, um, do that. And, and also, anyways, it doesn't matter. There's not too much because the real protection is actually occurring in the encryption and the tweak factor is just to prevent like the standard ECB attack. With CBC, the, um, when you do a stand, uh, um, if you corrupt the ciphertext, you only actually corrupt 
the current block and the next block. And then after that, because the next ciphertext blocks is the correct one and you do the XOR for decryption, then all future cipher, um, ciphertext blocks are now magically healed again. So even if, you, um, even if an attacker was to um, uh, uh, corrupt the ciphertext, you'd only have two blocks of data that was corrupted. It, does that answer enough of your? So then um, I also bring in counter mode because that is commonly used, but you also, again, have to be very careful when using counter mode because if you use the same counter again, very bad things will happen because now an attacker can simply take your output cipher, cipher text, the two cipher texts, XOR them together, and they'll get the XOR difference between your plain text. And that is not at all very good. <laughs> Because now you can, and especially if the attacker is able to control one of the two ciphertexts, because now they can generate the data and actually say, oh, well, since I know this plain text, I get, got the encryption, XOR, my, XOR the two together, I now have this encrypted, then I XOR my known plain text back on, and now I have the plain text out. So, but luckily, Jelly does not implement counter. It could theoretically do it securely, but it's not. So, as I mentioned, instruction pipelining is very important to how AES achieves its performance. And as I mentioned, it, um, I was very puzzled as to why the original AES um, XTS encryption did not perform very well. And I knew that. So I decided to look at the code. And one of the big problems was is that it was only processing one block at a time. And so normally, um, if you just, um, depending upon what architecture you're on, the, um, the performance latencies on these can range from like four to about seven cycles. And some of the architectures have the inverse throughput of an instruction being in about one or two inst um, in, uh, cycles per instruction. And so that means that, you know, if you're doing a stand, you know, as this, diagram shows, this is assuming a seven cycle latency with a dispatch issue of every cycle. And as you can see, we've now done three blocks in literally two more clock cycles than if we had done um, them serially. And so now we've hit, we have done three times as much work with just a very marginal increase. And um, the Intel paper actually talks about that. Um, I'm. Sh um, processors have significantly improved since the original Intel paper. The original Intel paper recommended eight rounds, which is what I actually ended up implementing to pipeline, but I think now with most modern processors, four may actually be better because almost all the modern processors are like a, a four cycle latency with one, one, um, one instruction per cycle. So. So that, so that gives you a huge boost. Yes? Is this something that you were able to measure? Uh, what, what do you mean by measure the? Were you able to measure the, the efficacy of your pipeline with one implementation versus the other? Do you know how many stalls there were, how many times the pipeline was? I did not actually do any of those low, me low level measurements, but like one of my very first implementations, um, I, I did do that, but um, I forget if I have the slide, but when I actually finally did all of my changes, I pulled the original XTS algorithm out into user land, so that way I could get rid of all the kernel overhead. I didn't have to recompile kernels, do all of that stuff. The original algorithm was performing at about 150 megabytes per second in user land, and the original, um, my original pipeline boosted that to over a gigabyte per second. And then with some other tweaks, like with the improved Galois LFSR and other stuff, I got that improved to over two gigabytes per second in user land on the same uh, on a 3.4 gigahertz machine. So, so the just the pipeline already showed significant improvement. I forget exactly how detailed my LFSR um, um, diagram, which I'll be talking about in a second, how it was. So. But um, yeah, I do actually also use, I did use PMC um, stat 
to, to actually measure performance, but I didn't actually do any of the really other crazy counters that they have, which is like, you know, how many cycles were not actually dispatching instructions or anything like that. So, but I, I, it would be interesting to see though. So the, the other part, as I mentioned, is the, if we go back, uh, if you guys remember the um, XTS, between every, um, between every block, we actually have to compute a tweak factor. And this is, um, this is alpha, which is the primitive element in the Galois field, which in, is pretty much always two. And so that is what makes it a Galois LFSR. But in order to compute that, we need to do this. And the original code was not very efficient at doing this. It was doing it a byte at a time and using a bunch of branches. So, I mean, well, it works, you know. <laughs> uh, then PJD did a little bit of improvement where he decided to actually improve it to using 64, by, um, 64 bits at a time. So now we only have one branch and we're using a lot less instructions. So um, my uh, friend, Mike Hamburg, I was actually talking with him who, um, helped me with a lot of this, and he actually came up with a new interesting way of handling the um, tweak, computing the tweak factor using, since, um, using SSE instructions. Since I'm using ASNI, I know that I have access to these SSE instructions, and you know, even with this code, you, know, you're, you have to do a load and an and, and you know, shift, and do a lot of other stuff. So the, with his help, it turns out that we can actually do a simple GAWA LFSR increment in five SSE instructions. <laughs> and so this is the code that we actually end up using. Um, this is the, we load up a constant, we do a shuffle, we do a shift right by 31, and that with the alpha mask, and then we do a shift left by one, and then we XOR the results on. And to give this a little bit more of a better diagram, we have the, um, this picture. So the input is this. What happens is, is that we shuffle the words around, which is basically, uh, turns out to be a simple left rotate by 32-bit words. Then we do the shift right arithmet arithmetic by 31. And that basically ends up splat splatting the entire high bit over all the registers. So now the register, if the high bit was a zero or a one, now that word contains either a zero or a one. And then now we add the and mask. The first, the first few three words are all ones because if it's a one, we end it with a one. We've now carried the, um, the high bit from one word to the next word. Now the next part is, is that if the um, if you end up shifting out, the, well, the way the Galois LFSR is implemented, if you end up shifting out, this high one out is a one, then you need to XOR, you need to basically do a reduction step, and that re uh, reduction step is XORing the constant um, 87 into the low byte. And so if we end up shifting out a high one out of the input, this will actually come out ending to um, 87. If there is a one, if it wasn't, it'll be zero and no, no harm, no foul. Then we do the shift. We XOR, we XOR these two together, and now we have done a, a LFSR increment. And so, and that ends up with the intrinsics that used here. It compiles down to basically five instructions as opposed to the tens of instructions otherwise used. So one of the decisions that I made when I was developing this software was that I was going to go use intrinsics. And there, if you look at all the code out there, everybody's doing hand assembly. OpenSSL has a crazy Perl script to generate its assembly. And it's like, re I really don't want to deal with that. Importing it into FreeBSD would be a pain. We don't have Perl in base, so then I'd still have to input the Perl, but then I'd pre-generate it. You know, we can't regenerate it, all that other stuff. So 
maintainability to me means intrinsics. Yes, it's, uh, intrinsics is almost like assembly, but you're only using assembly for the key parts that you want, and the rest of it you're letting the compiler. It does turn out that you do not get the same performance using intrinsics as you would use hand-rolled assembly, but the question is, is that de degradation and performance managed by the um, maintainability? The other interesting thing is, is that I can now use the exact same code on both i386 and AMD64 boxes. I do not have to have different assembly source files because all of the code compiles exactly the same. I'm, you know, I'm using, under, there's, I forget, I forget, I don't think I've mentioned it, but the data type used to represent the 128 bit data types are exactly the same between that. So if you look at the current um, ASXDS code in FreeBSD, the only differences between i386 and AMD64 right now is the key scheduler, and that's only because I didn't bother to improve it yet. So, one of the other advantages of the intrinsics is that it actually works around an ABI limitation with, that AMD64 has. AMD64 can only pass in, I forget if it, darn it, my notes are not showing, um, it's either four or eight registers. And as you know, if any other additional arguments have to be passed on the stack. And so even if you're calling a really hot function that's like doing eight encryptions at a time, you're now gonna be spilling out, um, possibly putting some of your inputs onto a stack, and also the return values, you can actually only pass back, a f even though the ABI allows two return XMM registers, yes? You, that is correct. The only reason why I'm comparing it is, is that almost everybody uses out-of-line assembly for all of their routines. And so the, um, the, the, also the inline assembly, you still have the same difficulty in passing. I've actually never, and I will admit, I've never actually tried to do, you know, multi, like, you know, eight, eight argument inline assembly stuff. So it is possible that we could do that. That should just work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that 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 is an intro. But you still so also a lot of the inline assemblies they actually do like either an entire crypto algorithm or whatever, and don't do the builds up. And so this way, I can actually have simple um, building blocks and stuff. So, but yeah, that's that is a good point. Um, so as I mentioned. Um, with the inline functions, we're actually able to bypass that limit. And the, also, the ASXTS um, code actually had an interesting thing where they actually used a common crypt function that passed an argument whether it was an encrypt or decrypt function. And so by being able to use inline um, intrinsics, I was able to actually have both the encrypt and decrypt registers map up. And so there was less reorganization. And I, as you said, I think the uh, inline assembly would be able to do the same thing. So, um, As I mentioned, the assembly, there's a few pros, you know, tighter instruction scheduling. You know, one, one of the big problems, um, one of the bugs that somebody else discovered in my original code was that there were a few cases where the buffers would actually be unaligned. And um, being able to get the de if you, by default, if you cap um, all the both Clang and GCC, when you compile code that references the 128-bit data type, it actually always issues a load that requires the data to be aligned, and it will fault if the data is not. And that's part though why there's any difference because almost all the processors execute the same, almost exactly the same, and there's only a slight penalty for unaligned. I'm not quite sure, but they choose to do the difference. And so there's, and then the other advantage was that um, GCC uh, did not uh, support AS, AS and I intrinsics. And let's see here, I'm, so, so yeah, so one, one, 
G FreeBSD at the time that I did this work, which started, oh, yes. It, yeah, we, we uh, yes, I'm not sure which GCC first started to support ASNI, but since we're using 421, uh, and actually the real problem was that it's our bin utils that doesn't support ASNI, not our GCC, because even if you were to use like inline assembly, it gets passed to whatever bin utils we have compiled, so. So um, when I did all of this work, GCC was still considered a supported architecture, even though i386 and AMD64 had switched over to Clang. And there were still a number of people who, for um, various reasons, chose to remain compiling on GCC, and I did not want to be the person to leave them out hanging in the wind. So as I mentioned, Clang, everything just worked, and as I mentioned, our GCC and bin utils is very, very old, and we're hopefully going to get rid of that soon. So I had to add, add AES and I support, and actually at the same time I added PCL mole QDQ, which is a carryless multiply um, with a double to a quad double. And so once I added AES and I instructions into bin utils and got and did the, wrote the appropriate intrinsic setter file, we could now actually use dash M A S on GC just like we could on Kling. And it wasn't too bad, but here's the original assembly that was used in order to um, generate the, to do the a, um, encryption. And this was actually just, I believe, um, this is just their uh, kind of counter ECB type mode and um, not, I'm trying to, I forget if they, they did have slightly more complicated instructions, but as you might notice, <laughs> ASNC was not, it was commented out and replaced with a byte string. And this was because of the fact that our bin utils did not support ASNI instructions, and so in order to get the code to work and compile, he, um, the original committer actually had to use a byte string Compile it, I'm, I'm not sure how he did it, compiled it with Clang or whatever, or hand assembled it and got that. And as you can see, we, we, load, we end up loading our data, or actually no, we load up our, uh, we load up the pointer to the IV and make sure that the, um, well, actually, sorry, up there is where we load the pointer to the IV, and if the um, IV if the pointer to the IV is null, we skip over it. Otherwise, we load the data from the IV, apply XOR on, and then we now do um, start applying the round keys. We, um, we, this actually applies the first round key, increment, do a round, decrement the round counter. If we still have rounds to go, do it over again, and then do the last one, and again, as you can see, AES and last was um, was also a byte string, and obviously there's a return at the end that I didn't want to make the font too small for you guys. <laughs> so as I implied, and you've actually seen a little bit of the intrinsics code, the intrinsics code provides a 128-bit data type, and there are a few different ones, but the one since we're all doing integer math, I used the underscore underscore m128i they appear to very like their underscores and their M's and all of that namespaces. And then depending upon um, some, of the fun, some of the intrinsics are built and um, implemented as built-ins, and part of that is in order to properly handle constant propagation because some of the arguments to an intrinsic will actually be a constant or a computed constant, but it turns out that, at, I think it's at least with GCC, if you, Inline assembly, if it's a computed constant, it won't know actually, if you go through enough layers, it won't know to actually be able to fold it into a constant. And so there is still the issue that I think it's uh, PCL mole QDQ. If, if under other in, in circumstances, 
because I did not go through the work of making PCL mole QDQ a built-in, there are certain cases where you won't successfully compile it because of the constant, constant folding. It's not there. And so let's see here. Um, features must be enabled by the compiler flag. The AES instructions are um, enabled by dash M AES, and the PCL mole QDQ is in, in, enabled by dash M PCL mole. And as I mentioned, there's no easy way to handle unaligned data in intrinsics. And by easy meaning just set an attribute, this, this data, this pointer is now unaligned. And this would also be very useful in some of the ARM work and other stuff, but they, even though other architectures also have the unaligned loads, for some reason, none of the compilers ha have the flag. There. What happens if you set uh, one um, I believe I've tried it, and even though you set it, um, both Clang and GCC ignores it. There. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I. I've. There's. I. I. I actually in the code. I actually have commented out one of the align things and commented on that. So. So yeah, um, that, that would actually make my life easier if both GCC and Clang supported it, but that can't happen until we actually do GCC. And another way that you can actually work around this is which I, and I actually end up using both of these depending upon their uses, is actually telling the compiler that it's a structure, that the M128i data type is actually in a structure and that the structure is packed. And by declaring that it's packed, it now tells the compiler I have no clue what the alignment is. And it manages to do the proper load instructions. So finally, yes, uh, did somebody have a question or? Oh, sorry, it's yeah. the language spec says this is a point to the structure which you can follow. So you know the model, it's not a mod uh, that is correct, but also like the packed attribute is it not part of the C99, C11 spec, yeah, so, so it's <laughs> correct. Oh, we know yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's a <laughs> yeah, no, I, and I agree. It was it was a hack. I mean, I could have rewritten the code so that instead of using a packed structure, I did all these separate loads, and it would have done the exact same thing. But I'm using this hack since I know it works, and it provides much more concise code. And part of the reason why I chose to use intrinsic was to get concise code. So, And so this is a, um, a single round AES encryption. I do not actually show the eight round partly because the code would be a little bit longer. But now instead of using that assembly file that you saw earlier, this is now what it looks like sans the um, IV application. And I don't know about you, but I would if I'm going to have to look at code, I'd much rather look at this as opposed to the assembly. So getting all of the code together, um, tested you know, in user land and doing all that other stuff is all fine and dandy, but the whole point of this project was to make it work, run faster in the kernel. And the next question, so it turns out that the kernel build and structure does not have uh, does not have the standard header files that you do in user land, and our standard kernel does not have the intrinsic headers because well, all the intrinsics are SSC. You're not supposed to use floating point in the kernel except for when with special work you can. So the question is: is now we have all of this intrinsics, how do we make it compile? Luckily. With uh, BSD's config, you can, there's actually a separate file that lets us call out special instructions on how to compile a C file. And so we do the really naughty thing of removing no standard ink from the kernel compile. And so this flag no standard ink means don't include the standard include header files. The reason why I can get away with this is I made sure that the API for this one file is uses no kernel interfaces and has a very limited API such that I don't need to depend upon any of the kernel header files that could possibly pollute the compile and I come up with just the right amount um, and also the default compile is actually O2 and 
And uh, some of my testing 03 got better performance, but when I was actually recently working on AES GCM, I actually found out that 03 gave me worse performance than 02. But <laughs> another fun problem of compilers. So I have to enable MNX, SSE, and the AES instructions. And so now we are able to, um, with this in there, we are now able to compile our code. So the next thing is performance testing. If you, how many people know of Ministat? <laughs> Ministat is a utility that PHK wrote a number of years ago. If you do any basic benchmarking or whatever, whatever it is a very simple to use utility to actually tell, did I make did the changes that I make actually make a difference in the performance? Because a lot of times, you know, if you're doing a build, timing your build world or whatever, the times will vary from run to run. And it may look like they improve, but actually it turns out that the variation between the build world times or whatever you're measuring is so significant that you can't, it looks like it improved, but actually the variance is too high that you cannot actually say that my changes improved timing. So with Ministat, it's a very basic utility that you provide it a simple file with numbers, and um, each file, each file that you provide is basically a set of numbers for one configuration option, and it will compare the result, um, average results and standard deviations and that sort between each files and say, was there an improvement? So in this case, the first file, the fastest one was X, which was the ASNI with, I believe, sync disabled. And luckily, this one, the variation was not very good. So you probably could tell from by eyeballing it that it was. But now we actually have at 95% confidence that the other two performed significantly worse than what we are. So uh, FreeBSD now actually includes this as part of the base distribution. It is no longer in tools, which is uh, very useful. So. If you need to do any benchmarking, always do at least three to five runs, pass your data through Ministat to confirm that. So this is based, you know, you can use this for simple testing and other stuff. Now the next question is, how do you identify various hotspots and other stuff? And this is where PMC stat comes in to helpful, being helpful. PMC, uh, a few years ago, I wanted to do, um, I was at my work and I wanted to do some performance evaluation. And I was like, I, I know Free, uh, FreeBSD has uh, PMC counters. And I was like, well, with PMC counters, the overhead is virtually zero. You can run it and you don't get a slowdown. But if you run like the standard dash PG compile with GProf, the performance can be five, 10 times slower, which if you're doing timing, um, net things that are timing <laughs> critical, <laughs> timing critical, the uh, G, the you basically can't do it with GProf. But and annoyingly, Linux at the time, and I think they still do, do not enable it by default. But in FreeBSD, we actually have userland ability to call in PMC stats so it's available to all users and it just works and gives you really awesome data. And so we can generate PMC stat data with this and the, the dot test perf was my test program that I was doing. And so this, there's, as you mentioned, there's a lot of different there's lots of different counter statistics that you can do. You can get like L1 cache misses, L2 cache misses, like um, you know, branch stalls. There's very, all, very many different types of counters that you can use. And it gives you much better idea of what to do. So this, is a, um, this was a sam simple sampling um, of when the machine was running that we weren't running the halt, i.e. idle. One of the problems that I ran into was that um, PMC stat has different output formats. It can actually output GProf format, but apparently I ran the tool too long. I created too many samples, and GProf has, I believe, a 16-bit limit to all the counts for the various things. And well, I had a few that were larger than that. 
So I could not um, use gprof. But luckily, call tree or the call tree format, which is used by kcache grind, came to the rescue. And so this is once you generate your statistics and um, you now convert it into the appropriate call tree output. How many people here have you have seen kcache grind? <laughs> And so it gives you very pretty graphics. This is one of them. I'll pull up uh, another uh, in a little bit. I'll actually show a demo. So this may look very confusing, but this is basically the idle thread. This is actually, if you might notice, ASNI ENC8. That's my eight, um, eight block encryption. So this is basically all the code that ASNI was doing. This was the, um, the idle thread. Oh, I should actually say, this is actually um, the area is about how much time each of the functions and the part, and they're layered into each other that it consumes. So this, these big blocks of idle are this specific function consuming time, while the, um, and then the blocks within it actually denote what the child function calls are. And so this one, you can kind of see this is highlighted. When I was probing around, I happened to note, if I hadn't been running this, I didn't even notice that there was this other thread, which was a uh, crypto ret proc, was consuming about, when, you, when adjusted, about 15% of the CPU. And as far as I know, it's like, why would I be running this other thread that I had no idea? And so upon further investigation, it turns out that the ASNI thread, even though um, the crypto, the ASNI crypto, open crypto driver was doing calls synchronously. It was not actually telling the open crypto framework that it was doing all of its work synchronously. And so when it actually did all of its work and returned, the open crypto driver, in order to help avoid locking issues, was actually scheduling another thread to do the callback. And so this is based, so th there was about 15% C um, CPU used just to switch to another thread to run a little bit of code and then switch back. And so if, I'm not sure, when I enabled that flag in my performance testing, I saw about a 27% increase in performance, which just by literally adding a flag to the initialization, and I was quite surprised. And other performance, uh, I will admit, Flame graphs has been around for a while, but I saw them for the first time yesterday, so I had to generate this one real quickly. Um, I did some, uh, another very nice thing about FreeBSD is, is that there, the Geom framework makes layering block very well, and one of the um, blocks that uh, PJD wrote was uh, G0. And all it is is basically a source of zeros or any other thing you want, or, and a sync, and so it makes it takes a lot of the disk and other processing out, like even MD, even though it is very, has very similar modes, this is even lighter weight than MD. And so with this, this is very similar to the call graph, and I'll actually show you, um, the nice thing is, is the flame graph, will, if you actually have the full SVG version in your browser, you can actually mount, mouse over the various components and actually see how much percentage of time each of them are using. And so these are, got to disable witness, otherwise your performance will suck. Limit ourselves to um, jelly thread, um, to one thread. There, I need to work on, the, the, I'll have another slide about that, but the number of threads used, there are benefits to using multiple threads, like if G0, if you're, um, you're accessing the same um, uh, uh, jelly volume on multiple times, having multiple threads can be beneficial. But at the same time, if you have eight disks like my original ZFS file system did, and Jelly launches six threads because you have a six core box for all eight disks. Oh, and by the way, your root's also encrypted, so there's another two. Your swap's also encrypted. Your um, um, Zill file is encrypted. Suddenly you have a machine with 100 threads doing Jelly encryption, and all of them are gonna be competing for the CPUs. And so by being, being able to set jelly threads down to one on those machines, you're already getting the multi-core multi performance by 
um, the multi-disk access. And so in this case, I um, just did some tests on my AMD A10 box that runs at 3.4 gigahertz that boosts up to 4, 4 gigahertz. I am able to get 900, about 900 megabytes per second. Yes? So you're looking at a, a six times improvement from where you started. Yeah. Uh, how much of that was due to the change in the, the cipher versus the, the four at a time processing versus the, the built-in? So my original test was actually using XTS. So there was no actually change in Cypher. Okay. So it was all, this like 6x plus was all seen purely due to pipelining and the LFSR increase and the sync increase changes. Okay. Can you say a little bit more about the, the use of the 128 built in and, and why it helps? I understand the, the bytes to eight bytes processing and you did expect linear there. Yeah, yeah. I'm quite confused about the 128 on 64-bit machine. Oh, what do you... What is that built in, what is usually the built in do for you at the processor level? Okay, so, well, so one of the things is, is like with the LFSR, you, you know, now you're doing like with, if you're doing a 64-bit LFS, you're talking about the, the LFSR crank where go, going from 64 to 128. Well, first of all, less instructions because with the 64, now you have to do two XORs, you have to do a few shifts and tests and other stuff in order to do that. Also, the other thing is is that um, we're already, if we have all of our data already in XMM registers, if we do a 64-bit, we have to actually like spill it to the stack um, in order to actually transfer it into a 64-bit register and back again. One of the things with using intrinsics and other stuff, basically the data path is entirely in XMM registers. We do not actually touch any of the 64-bit registers through the data path from the time that we load it from memory to the time that we've done all of our work to the time we write it out. Do we gain convenience to sync to registers? So, uh, so SSH uses... Uh, yes, yeah, the, the, the XMM. Okay, sorry. Well, no, the SSE2 registers are called XMM. They, well, there is also YMM, but yeah. It, <laughs> they are the SSE2 registers or whatever. So, so yeah, so the performance was, now we're actually, I'm now actually getting decent enough performance and other stuff. There are a few things left for improvement on, uh, uh, on this. One of the things is that uh, only the people who are using the open crypto calls directly are actually improved. There are uh, various calls that are using direct calls to Rindall encrypt that will not see this. Um, I'd like to see that change. Part of the problem is is handling FPU context saves when you're in a non-sleepable context, which is most of those cases, becomes a little bit difficult because now you have to spill like about a kilobyte of context somewhere and you can't allocate memory. There's actually a, um, one of the issues that I've noticed is that um, under certain cases, Jelly does large memory allocation. And by large me memory allocation, I'm talking greater than four kilobytes. And in FreeBSD, we do not have any zones that are greater than 4K, which means that we have to do a large page allocation, which means that we have to do IPIs to shoot down TLBs and other really big nasties. And so by switching, I'm seeing about four or five percent consumption in um, malloc and free and I believe switching to a UMA zone or something similar would take that to basic virtually zero and so that would be another thing believe it or not it looks like key schedule is actually consuming a decent amount of time and so we could actually pipeline the two cents for that and I also have some uh, somewhat unrelated to this but I'm also working on some a ASGCM improvements and adding that to the crypto and I believe, at least in my case, the last big performance problem that I have on my ZFS Jelly encryption is, is that I chose to use SHA-256 for all of my checksums, partly to have pseudo-authentication on my, I'm, since I'm running a little bit of time, I'm not gonna expand upon that, but you can talk to me later about that. But SHA-256 actually turns out to be very slow, and I think this now in my application becomes the long pull in the tent, actually significantly more than um, AS, so. All right, so any questions?
Uh, David, if you out. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you tried changing the uh, MCPU client so that the compiler then knows what pipeline you're targeting? No, I have not done any tests on that. Partly because I'm, you know, I haven't tried in native and other stuff like that. So. So the um, by default, it would use a fairly conservative pipeline model. Ah. Okay. Oh, it, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, there's um, there's an instructions manual out there that has most of the latencies and throughputs on most of them. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah, and and actually, if you do your compi world compile with the appropriate ones, it should automatically be picked up. Yes. So um, I have I've seen those, and I have not actually really looked very much. Part of the thing is, is I don't think there's going to be any, um, at least for AES, there's not going to be any performance. I mean, yes, we could probably two, do two LFSR cranks at the same time, but considering it's only five instructions to run it now, <laughs> so OK, we're, we'd be saving five instructions, most of them pipeline. So, and I was thinking that one, one thing we might save, though, is the Uh, so oh. I have not thought about using loads that way. Part of the, the other thing is is that I also want to make sure this code runs on as many processors as possible. And there's <laughs> using the wider 256 or even the 512 bit in registers that are coming up soon would be interesting. So, yes. Uh, yes. Well, I haven't actually done any of my performance mon um, testing, but I have verified that um, all of this works on i386 and stuff. Are you looking at any other processors? Well, so there are like I, I know I do know that some of the other processors do have AS instructions, but I haven't looked at them yet. Partly um, n lack of time and. I mean, this all came out because I wanted my uh, storage system to actually perform at a decent er era, and so I haven't had those. Yes? Um, I'm trying to pick up the idea. Have you pushed the results in the open SSL? So, are there different people are aware that you can check this performance improvement? So, so actually, OpenSSL, um, as I mentioned earlier, they actually use uh, basically Perl scripts to generate raw assembly. So they actually are getting that performance. And as if you remember the slide way back, here, let me pull up the, this slide. Uh, uh, this slide, you can actually see, you know, with CBC decrypt and XTS, we are almost getting, you know, Three and a half, four gigabytes per second. So there, and that's as at, um, in my testing on my code in user land. I'm not. It's been a while since I did that. I was only getting about 2.2 to 2.4 gigabytes. So as you can see, there's actually a significant gap even between my XTS code and OpenSSL. So, all right. Is this what? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I and I do do some arm work, if, as as you probably know, and so yeah, I just haven't. But none of my arm boards work the way that I want them yet, so I haven't been able to do much with them. So, all right. Ah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I can only imagine. Since it's so new. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you for coming. Hope you have a good.